evening. My name is Ross Kettles. I'm the project manager for the Nivyars Wetlands Special Management Area. Good evening. My name is Eugene Handik, and I'm one of the two conservation managers for the Nivyars Wetlands Special Management Area. Okay, the Nivyars Wetlands Special Management Area is situated at the very southernmost tip of the African continent in a unique environment with unique vegetation and features. This should give you an idea of, of what we're all about. And we often refer to as the biggest uh, inland freshwater wetland system in South Africa. And we're definitely the southernmost, um, which makes this area very unique in many ways, very rich in biodiversity. It's an important um, bird area because of the wetlands, obviously, lots of waterfowl and wetland specialists, but we also very rich in, in fauna, um, in terms of indigenous wildlife, such as the endangered uh, Val Rebuck and um, many other species, including buffalo and um, eland, uh, all occur naturally in the area. This map over here will show you where we're situated. To the south, we've got the Gullis National Park, which shares our entire southernmost boundary. Um, if you look at the ocean below you, it's a transition between the Indian and the Atlantic Oceans, which is also characteristic of the weather that we have here. To the west of us, we have the De Mont Estuary, which flows out of the um, Zutendals Flay in the Yenangnes River, which is a Ramsar protected area. This gives you an idea of the, of the river system. I'll talk you through it. We have the Nibiyaz River. There are several very big pans and wetland areas, the most notable ones being Boskral Flay, Paul Flay, and Zutendals Flay. The Nivyaz River flows into the Zutendals Flay and comes out as the Yenangnes River, which flows into the Yenangnes Estuary and comes out at De Mont, which is a Cape Nature uh, game reserve. <clears throat> Sadly, this is the situation that we are, are dealt with. We live in a very fragmented world now because of the burgeoning human populations. Um, sadly, animals and people need to eat, so agriculture is very important. So if you look at this map, you'll see that the dark green areas are indigenous untouched bush and the khaki colored areas are agriculture. This is in the form often of cattle farming, sheep farming, it's a stronghold for marina sheep, wine farming, and then winter crops such as canola and wheat. Okay, our conservation commitment is we're going to talk through the whole project and, and but, but basically we're trying to find a new way of combining agriculture with conservation and finding novel ways of the two working together. So accordingly in 2002, um, a statement of intent was signed amongst the landowners and by 2008, the constitution was signed for the Nibiyaz Wetland Special Management Area. Some people may ask, why did it take so long? Simply because it was a novel idea and it still is had never been tried before. And we had to feel our way through it and to get buy-in from all of the members wasn't easy because a lot of compromise was involved in the, in the landowners themselves having to give up some of their privileges. And um, it must be understood that it is a massive investment on the part of the landowners. And the whole initiative is valued at about 1 billion rand. Many of you may ask, what is a special management? But simply put, it's an area of excellence and good practice, whereby the ethos of sustainable development is served and practiced. So in other words, we can word that just by saying that we're trying to find ways to make this area pay for itself, because sustainability means that it's going to be a long term. Okay, our structure, we are governed by our constitution. And very importantly, what our constitution does is it locks the, the landowners into the, into the um, whole operation by means of title deed restrictions, meaning that if they sell or if they die, um, the, the people that inherit the farm or purchase it have to buy into the clauses, the clauses and conditions of the constitution also, meaning that the area is protected in perpetuity. Um, we are registered non-profit organization um, in the name of the Nibiyaz River Nature Reserve. Um, we basically recognized uh, all over and we, we, we try to work very well with conservation groups such as WWF, the Hansel Hazen Charitable Trust, the Overberg District Municipality. But having said that, we are independent. 
we don't have to play second, second fiddle to any other organization. Why now? Um, basically, we all know that our predecessors didn't always manage things the right way, often not out of malice, but just out of not knowing any better. Um, we find ourselves in a position now where almost a quarter of our wetlands have been disturbed, some of them irreparably so. So it's our um, incentive is to restore these wetlands, get them going, get the natural um, ecosystems that go along with the wetlands flowing again once more. This is why this area is vitally important to us. Um, we have about 40% of the critically endangered Elam ferrocrete and about 50% of the endangered Agullis sand fangos. So ecologically, we're very, very important. And we're probably at the world's stronghold in these endangered plant species. We're also home to a lot of endangered birds and rare birds, such as the black harrier, the blue crane, the southern black coran, marsh areas, etc. It's a very good hotspot and safe haven for birds to, to migrate to, and also the permanent birds. We also have a herd of Bontebok. Um, it's important for us to give credit to the predecessors of the, of the landowners within the SMA because they were instrumental in saving the Bontebok from, from extinction. Um, we're probably one of the best habitats for Bontebok in the country and one of the biggest um, owners of Bontebok in the country. We also host the very rare bar rebuck and the Cape Christbook, which are also quite endangered. If you have a look at our wetlands, this is a typical photo of a wetland. You can see um, the, the water itself and the, in the vegetation, um, which in this case is palmite. Palmite is very important in filtering water. Um, and this is often grows on peat beds. Uh, peat beds are very important in storing carbon. And together, palmite and peat form sponges, which, which filter the water, but they also store water in the dry months and slowly release it um, to keep the rivers flowing and the wetlands full. Okay, if you have a look at our timeline, in 2008, buffalo were released. They were the first buffalo back in approximately 150 years. Um, in 2010, hippos were released, and they serve a very important function in the, in the wetlands in that they're eco-engineers by opening up trails and letting the water flow between the pans and the wetlands. In 2013, we received funding from the Hans Hohes and Charitable Trust, and we're very grateful they're still on board with us. They fund our ecological maintenance teams. And in 2018, WWF came on board as an expansion project for, for avian species, um, mainly in the form of alien clearing. This gives you another idea of the reality that we faced. Um, the picture is of a very rare and endangered protea pudens, but it is surrounded by Australian myrtle. And um, probably the biggest challenge that we have on the SMA is dealing with um, aliens and the continual having to clear them. It's a very time consuming, labor intensive and expensive undertaking. Um, aliens increase the, the, the wood mass per hectare, which causes a real risk for fires. The fires become so hot that it just wipes everything out. And also in times of flood with the shallow root structure, they will get washed out and disturb the soil and cause more wash away than, than it's actually necessary. And then obviously the most obvious point is that it encroaches on indigenous vegetation and forces it out. For some of our activities, we implement a range of activities that aim to counter these threats through funding support and through the membership fee paid by our landowners. We employ a conservation team across our conservation area doing various projects. Our area is about 47,000 hectares in size. <clears throat> so we as the conservation team use the biodiversity management plan that we developed with our members and experts to guide our operational activities. We work according to a number of programs which are protecting our nature, supporting social well-being, promoting tourism, accessing our biodiversity, teaching about nature, promoting sustainable agriculture. So the major deliverables are the following, our ecological monitoring, research, game management, removal of invasive alien species, fire management, natural resource management, and stakeholder engagement. 
So, alien tearing has a direct positive effect on fungus vegetation quality, abundance, and diversity, as removing the alien invasives species means that the fungus will not have to compete with the invasives for precious nutrients, water, and resources in the soil. Freeing these resources up for the indigenous flora, meaning our improved fungus vegetation type, as well as the improvement of the wetlands. So these areas highlighted in green are all alien clearing blocks across the Nubias. Uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly how much it totals up to, as they are different blocks in a different year. So a lot of our alien clearing is funded through the Agalis Biodiversity Initiative uh, under the Department of Environmental Affairs Land Use Incentive Scheme. And alien vegetation management is a long-term goal or problem as seed banks for some of these species are viable for about 20 years. So if you have a look at this, this is just a nice drone photo from before we started our alien clearing at the one of our sites. Um, and if you have a look at the next one, you can actually see now that we started the alien clearing, you can see how the ecosystem function is returning. You can see the old channels now emerging from under the alien vegetation that has choked them up. <coughs> so as part of our wetland rehabilitation project funded by WWF South Africa, the project maintenance teams cleared aliens across 289 hectares of wetland, uh, some seven or eight kilometers worth of river system. So this photo shows alien clearing area three years ago when stark contrast between what is cleared and uncleared. So this was actually the project boundary and the green that you can see is all Acacia saligna or Port Jackson from Australia. Um, and in front of that, you can see the windrows that represent where we have cleared. Right. And this is what that same area looks like now, three years later. You can see how much of a difference the alien clearing is making. You can actually see the natural vegetation starting to come back. This is just another, some more before photos from one of our other alien clearing sites. This is at the start of the project. Yeah, you can see we're now started our intensive alien clearing where we're removing the mature vegetation. You can see the piles of vegetation on the left and the people standing next to the piles giving you an idea of the size. What we actually did there was we pulled all that vegetation off using uh, ropes and cables from the tractor. Now you can see what we've done here is we actually fenced off that area um, just to keep the cattle out to give that area a chance to regenerate because of all the disturbance from removing that vegetation out of the wetland. You can also see the channel where the water is and the palmit up against that channel where we actually stopped, uh, mostly because we couldn't get through the water. Right. Now, this one, you can actually see we waited for the summer months and we were able to get in there behind that channel. And although it's pretty difficult to see, you can actually see we've removed all of that dense vegetation that was on the other side of the channel. Um, we did not want to disturb the area any further, so we actually just left that material stacked in the river system there. This is a before photo looking down into the wetland from one of the lands next to the river. And this is what that same area looks like now four years later. Ecological monitoring. Numerous monitoring activities and methods are employed by the conservation team. And these are supported by wonderful funders such as WWFSA, the Hans Hohesen Charitable Trust. And some of these monitoring things include our biannual quack counts, coordinated, coordinated water AV4 milk counts, carried out on various wetlands and players along the Nibiaos River. We count the number of individuals and species of wetland birds, and the data is submitted to the University of Cape Town where it is added to the National Wetland Register, as well as captured for our records. So these are the results from our quack counts for the last four years on Fuel Flay, one of our bigger wetlands. Starting in January 2017, the wetland was 
full uh, of bird life and water. And then as the timeline advances, you can see by about May 2018, the wetland had actually dried up completely. Uh, and you can see the significant drop in bird life with, as a result of that. The seventh spike in the middle is as a result of us getting 50 mils of rain over a weekend, which provided just enough water in the wetland at a critical time for the birds to then uh, return to this wetland. But as we didn't get any more follow-up rain after that, the wetland dried out again. And you can see that numbers didn't really start to increase again until beginning of January this year, which just gives you an idea of the resilience of these wetlands that it can go through something like that, where it has dried out completely. And then with some rainfall and some water, you'll see the bird life will suddenly start bouncing back. So some of the other monitoring we carried out was pitfall traps. So next to my shoulder there on the right, you can see a piece of what is just boulders plastic held up with iron standards. And at either end of that is our buckets. Um, the idea being that small mammals and reptiles and amphibians move through the grass on either side behind me. They hit what we call the drift fence made of builder's plastic. It then diverts them into these buckets that you can see, like in front of me there. And some of the things that we caught in the buckets were cape skink, short-legged seps, and rumpals. <clears throat> it was also in these buckets or pitfall traps that we recorded our first ever cape platana for the New Wales Wetland Special Management Area. So Cape Platana is an endangered species and only found in areas associated with acidic blackwater, stretching from the Cape Peninsula to Cape Agulhas, as you can see in the map that has been inserted in the top right corner. Um, and there are only four locations left globally for Cape Platana. One of our other amazing finds was the microfrog, and this is a critically endangered species. Uh, in actual fact, it's so hard to find it, that little frog really is extremely little. It's about the size of your thumbnail. Um, so it just goes to show how vital research is here. And we were luckily assisted in finding this with, by some students from the University of Stellenbosch. Well, we've also collected baseline data for dragonflies to have a good look at our wetland health. And we've identified 15 different species overall, which include Cape skimmer and common thorntail, both Cape province endemics, and then the sooty threadtail, which is only found from Table Mountain to Hurtrofi. So to evaluate if our rehabilitation and maintenance activities, mainly the alien clearing within the wetland, were having an effect on mammals and bird species, we developed monitoring stations as pictured above, extremely advanced. We just planted a pole in the middle of the wetland. Uh, the arrow on top of the pole just indicates north so that we would always know where we to put our camera to start our fixed point photography. And on the bottom of the pole behind my colleague, there is a trail camera that we then rotated around the pole. The idea being the trail camera monitors uh, mammal movement in that area. These poles were also used for our fixed point bird counts. So the bird counts were carried out by either sighting the individual bird or recording the call. But some of the interesting species we saw, uh, Egyptian mongoose, Cape Christbuck, honey badger. So, <clears throat> The avian counts carried out from these six monitoring stations that we set up were done every single month from March 2018 to February 2021. So although you'll see that the line graph oscillates a lot, there is an overall increasing trend on these, which shows that the richness and abundance is improving over time, um, which also indicates that that is actually working. These are the uh, actual counts from the uh, individual sites across the clearing areas where we calculated the median avian 
species richness and abundance. And you'll see year one, the white bar, year two, the gray bar, and year three, the black bar. You'll see how significant the difference is between years one, two, and three. There are a few gaps. Uh, those results were uh, either from us not being able to get to the point or losing some of the data, like the cameras being flooded. Game management. So as mentioned earlier, we reintroduced game to the area that became locally extinct around 200 years ago, including things like buffalo and hippo. We also introduced eland and bontebok to add to the populations that were already here, as well as red heart mist and what also part of the Rao Kwafa project, which we'll chat about a little later. So we actively diff monitor the different species populations. The data we retrieve from this allows us to manage the translocations, maintenance, and mitigation of the animals and the infrastructure associated with them. So the red lines there represent our two game camps, approximately eight and a half thousand hectares and about 120 kilometers worth of fencing that run across multiple different farms. So the buffalo monitoring, we carry out regularly via telemetry as one of the cows has been fitted with a radio collar. So the buffalo were reintroduced not only as tourism, but also they carry out the function of, uh, of bulk grazes and um, specifically manage the Phragmites reed beds by eating down and reducing the amount of Phragmites in those reed beds. So as we mentioned, we're part of the Rao Kwaha breeding project. The aim being of the project being to breed back a representational animal to fill the niche of the extinct Kwaha. So we provide the grazing and the management for three herds and our management takes the form of monthly cuts and a photographic ID kit for each animal. <laughs> so our hippo were reintroduced as ecosystem engineers to create channels in specifically the Vascal wetland. As they walk through these wetlands, these channels, they create rehydrate the peat. And on a regular basis, we try to monitor them, but this usually just results in us pulling our hair out. So reintroducing the eland was a strategic approach to vegetation management. As these animals used to occur naturally in the area in the historical past, we have the added advantage in that they um, snap branches of trees and place stress on some of these invasive trees that are under biocontrol, resulting in better effect of the biocontrol on these invasive plants and eventually killing them. They also provide the, the browsing that fane boss needs. Fire management. Our fire management plan aims at creating a mosaic pattern of health ages across the Nivea's Wicked Special Management Area to not only improve health condition, but also to manage potential runaway fires by creating strategic fire breaks, such as you can see in this photo over here. <clears throat> so these orange blocks represent our fire management units across the Nivea's Wetlands Special Management Area. So Fanbos is a fire driven ecosystem. It needs the heat and the smoke from those fire, as well as the ash bed created by those fires to help the next generation of plants regenerate. Um, and the ideal fire cycle with fine moss is every 15 to 30 years. So we try and manage this by creating this mosaic of burn sites across the Nivias. Land use and infrastructure development with the support from our donors, such as the Hunts Harris and Charitable Trust, we employ an ecosystem services team, which is responsible for the maintenance of external and internal fences, the 120 kilometers worth that I mentioned earlier, as well as our buffalo, bomber, sacrificial and sacrificial fencing mats throughout the whole game camp area. So with our WWF support, we constructed this walkway that you can see in the bottom of the picture here across the channel. And this led earlier this year to the development of a burning platform and bird hide. The infrastructure was built to facilitate and improve the awareness of wetland conservation and bird species within the Nivias through environmental education as well as guided tours. So this is just a nice view of us busy building the bird hide and then what it looks like now that it's been complete. So while we employ two teams, our ecosystem services team and our WWF SA rehabilitation team, we also work with fantastic partners to participate in the Overberg wide alien clearing. This allows us to provide employment for additional teams funded by 
the Department of Environmental Affairs, although our landowners also provide employment for around 200 people. We also support students who want to get some hand-on experience in conservation with our volunteer program. So stakeholder engagement. Okay, I want to quickly talk about um, a food relief program that we, that we hosted this year. Basically, um, because of the alcohol ban, one of our members graciously gave us his, uh, the use of his brewery. You can see the big brewing tanks there. We use them to cook up food for a soup kitchen. And we also received additional funding from Harry Moore, who gave us a very generous donation, and also from the um, Cape Agalis municipality. We were able to cook 187,000 meals, which equated to about 6,000 meals per day for about six months from Monday to Friday. That made a huge difference to the, to the community. And we were very grateful for the people that came on board with us with that project. Okay. So the biggest part of our stakeholder engagement is, very, is a very integral part of our daily activities. Specifically, we need to uh, communicate with our landowners on a regular basis, uh, either as to the fact that we are just maybe driving onto their property, but also in terms of any projects that we are undertaking on their property, progress in these projects. And uh, one of our other stakeholder engagements was the Feinbos Forum. And uh, these are just us explaining one of our wetland rehabilitation projects to some of the guests at the Feinbos Forum. We also facilitate research related activities with external organizations and tertiary institutions, such as the University of the Western Cape. We provide the living laboratory space for them and uh, in return, they give us the data that they collect for our records. This is just a photo of us working with CREW, the custodians of rare and endangered wildflowers team from Sandby. They investigate through plant species presence across the movie arts. This is just some of the interesting plants that we've seen. Okay. Okay, tourism, income and biodiversity products. What we do offer on the on the maybe our special uh, wetland special management area wildlife tours, uh, they revolve mostly around the southern game camp and Buscroft Lake. Uh, people have the opportunity to see hippos, eland, springbuck, wanterbok, and probably more importantly, the wetlands themselves and the very rare vegetation that we find there. This is just a video showing the wetlands and the guided tours and what you're likely to see when you're on a game drive. Um, they're unique in that they aren't a typical game drive as you'd expect in the low field because the, the environment is so much different and unique. Funding and income. As you can imagine, running a project like this, you've seen some of the stuff that we do and the extent of it and the, and the physical size of the area that we manage doesn't come cheap. Um, members graciously fund us, uh, partly fund us in the form of an annual um, subscription fee. But we also rely on many NGOs to sustain our projects. Um, this is a bit of a two-edged sword. We're always very grateful for funding, but it also causes a lot of sleepless nights because funding typically comes with a term. It'll be one, two or three years, maybe six months. And more often than not, it's also for a specific project. Um, we're thinking of ways to, to come up with new funding models, um, possibly in the way of combining crowdfunding with the trust fund where people could invest money interest-free um, for a term, and then we could utilize the interest of that. And at the end of the term, they could get their capital back. But funding remains the single biggest stumbling block that we have, um, simply because it's just so expensive to run a project like this. Um, we would invite all of you to give us ideas on how we could make this more sustainable and funding ideas. Um, COVID has been a very interesting time for us too, because we've also noticed a trend where a lot of funding that used to go towards conservation now goes to humanitarian aids. Um, we're also looking at getting funding for climate change and um, to try and mitigate weather change in the form of alien clearing and 
and finding uh, biodiversity products from the, from the aliens that we do clear. Thank you very much for your time. And in conclusion, we would welcome comment and suggestions and ideas to help us take this forward. Um, we think that we've got a very important project here and that it's different to typical conservation products. And it's a window into the future as there are more people and less space for conservation. We have to find ways to combine agriculture with conservation. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Hi guys, thank you. I'd actually never heard of this area at all. So it's actually very interesting for me to learn something new about um, an area <clears throat> near, near one of uh, Sand Parks's um, or Gallus uh, Park. So thanks for the, the talk, very interesting. I'm just interested in terms of the peat um, that you mentioned there. How old is that, that peat? And if it's destroyed, how long would it take to recreate it? Have they done kind of dating or aging of the peat to, to try and determine um, that? I'll get that one. Uh, they did actually, I can't actually think of it off the top of my head. Um, we did receive some funding from the German government actually, who actually wanted to start a peat rehabilitation. Uh, and they did do some of that, but exactly how old and how long it would take to then recover this peat, uh, I can't actually say off the top of my head. Okay, so my colleague, Heather says it is millions of years old. Um, we have actually tried in some places, but the alien vegetation actually just grows so fast and the seed bank underneath that is, those seeds remain viable for 20 years. So um, as soon as that start coming back, it just sort of destroys everything from start again, as soon as we get a whole lot of flooding. Um, the other problem they discovered with our peat was it's not as good as the peat in Europe for carbon um, sequestration. Okay. Just to, that, mm -hmm. Gary, just to do that quickly, is, it's estimated that, that um, the carbon grows by about one millimeter per year. So in places um, where we've seen floods where three meters have been eroded away, so that's three meters, so that will give you an idea of the age. So it ages very slowly. It's not something that we can grow and we can't speed up the process. When you say eroded, I mean it what got washed down into the ocean, um, three meters taken off. Yeah, literally uh, the riverbed, just because of all the alien vegetation, just the it just narrowed the water stream, flowed down, and it just cut through everything, uh, and it just gets washed downstream. Uh, some of it ends up in some of the guys farmers' lands, others just ends up in the ocean eventually, and in the bottom of our flays as well and you partly answered my next question if i can um you mentioned the port jackson and the alien invaders um i, I was interested to how they actually got there in the fir first place how long ago i mean was this sort of from 100 kilometers away that it got there or were people actually positively planting it in that area for stabilization or or kind of how, how did it get there? Is there any sort of understanding? Bit of both, actually. Uh, there were programs in the 40s and 50s to actively plant some of these aliens for essentially that dune stabilization and to drain wetlands for farming and so on. So some of them were introduced, some of them had seed blow, uh, wind blown seeds that have slowly moved in. Uh, my conversations with some of the landowners is he saw one of these aliens there 40 years ago, if he'd known what a problem it was going to be today, he would have cut it down then already. So I hope that answers your question. No, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Marty. Um, Dr. Candice Janssen-Marenz, bit of from the University of the Free State. I'm going to ask you to unmute your hands up. Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Um, thank you for your presentation. I just wanted to find out, um, in your opinion, uh, how successful do you think your restoration and rehabilitation projects has been, if you would, would, would say? Um, 
I'll quickly answer this one. Eugene can add to it. It's been incredibly uh, successful so far, but it's also important to understand that it, you can't clear once. It's going to be a lifelong commitment because of the seedbed, which is, which is everywhere. So we will typically, we'll clear six months later, there'll be regrowth, we'll clear again. But what does happen is it becomes easier and easier to clear, but it's a very, very expensive and labor um, intensive process. I don't know if that addresses your, your question. Can't answer. Um, yes, uh, that, <laughs> sorry. Um, yes, that answers my question. I just have um, one or two questions, other questions. Um, it's more related to um, the water of the wetland. So um, I'm not sure if I missed it. Uh, how permanent is the water in the wetland? Is it permanent or is it seasonal or? A bit of both, actually. Um, we've got seasonal wetlands and we've got permanent wetlands. Our three biggest or four biggest clays are almost permanent. Um, the one that I mentioned earlier in the talk had last dried up about 50 years ago, so that'll give you an idea. Uh, but there are sections that dry out completely and there are sections where you can go and walk even in midsummer or late summer and it will still be squelching underfoot um, or you'd have to wear gumboots. So, yeah, some of it's very seasonal, some of it's absolutely permanent. All right. And then my last question. Um, uh, has there been any other research on other invertebrates um, in the water, such as um, plankton? No, not as far as I know. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doc. And then let's see. Annika Kriya's hand was up. Annika, uh, just put your hand up again if you would like to. And then we have, so I'm going to ask Richard. Richard, okay, I'll, Annika, I'll get you directly after Richard's question. Yeah, thank you. It's um, more like a follow-up that to, to the question that was just asked about um, in, if there's any research um, on invertebrates. Because uh, South Africa developed a, a monitoring, a river health uh, monitoring uh, system based on invertebrates. We tried to adapt it to a wetland this side. Um, it's called SARS. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we tried to adapt it to a wetland system. So, and, and it's based on invertebrates. So my question is, is there any one monitoring of the water quality as you remove this aquatic, uh, this invasive species do you see improvements in, in, in water quality um, by maybe physically measuring it or uh, maybe using vertebrates? Um, but I mean, that one is answered already because you don't do any in vertebrates. Do you do any water quality monitoring? And the other thing is just if there's any, um, it will be interesting to do um, in vertebrates research because they have fast life cycles so they can reflect uh, you know changes in stress level quite quick thank you thank you richard so, to answer your question there uh, we don't do any sort of water monitoring ourselves but the university of the western cape they do a lot of water research monitoring or research for us um, they then provide us with feedback uh, and they have got monitoring points actually at various places uh, above where we've started our clearing and below where we've finished clearing or are still in the process of clearing uh, to monitor things like salinity, uh, the conductivity in the water, so how much the electricity, um, things like pesticides and herbicides, that sort of stuff getting into the water. Um, I have heard about the SAS kits and doing that. I can't actually do that myself. <laughs> Right. But but to add to that, um, we would welcome any research initiatives. You know, if, if you've got contacts or if you've got any proposals, I think it's something that's very worthwhile that we'd love to get involved. In. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think the the work that you are doing there is is amazing, and 
I was amazed by the breadth of monitoring, the breadth of you know organisms, the the types of organisms that you are monitoring, the amphibians. The, you know you're monitoring quite a lot of of things, and that's in addition to the activities, the restoration activities. That's amazing work that you're doing. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Um, Annika, I don't know, your, your hand was up. I'm going to ask you to unmute if you have a question. Maybe it was answered already. Um, hello, yes, no, I think it was kind of answered um, by the questions asked by Dr. Richard and Dr. Anders. But yeah, it's basically just the same as, um, I think you definitely have a lot of space to also maybe look into the invertebrates because like Richard said, they are great indicators of wetland health and conditions. So you definitely have the opportunity for a lot of studies in that area. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, Thank you. welcome. Yeah. Wonderful. I'm going to move to the, uh, Chris, your hands up. Um, <laughs> if you have a question, <laughs> I was going I to. I think Andy, do you have a question? Or not? <laughs> yes, I, I was going to move to the chat section now. Um, and, 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 uh, it... and Professor Bond, when is you your next? Question? No, the, yeah. Wh uh, um, what do the hippos graze? How much grass is there in those wetlands? But let's yeah. start with Andy Clee. Um, Andy, I'm going to read your question. Um, um, and you might have uh, started answering it, uh, Eugene, in the in your first question with Marty. Could some form of carbon offset or sequestration funding be an opportunity for you? There might be a suitable partner um, partner business out there for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's that's something that's spending a lot of time on at the moment. Um, it's it's this this area of the, of, of the economy seems to be growing. There seems to be a lot of interest in it now. Um, and we are actively searching for people. We're speaking to a couple of organizations now. Um, and it seems as though a lot of funding, especially from Europe, has become available for the international sphere. So we're hoping to get a piece of that. But yes, it's something we're working towards and we're hoping to capitalize on in the near future. Wonderful. Thank you. Then from, um, thank you, Annie, for that question. From Michelle Swanepoel from a TUT, absolutely amazing work that has been done up until now. Well done. Uh, it's been mentioned that you take in volunteers from the University of Stellenbosch. Do you, by any chance, take in students studying nature conservation for the work integrated year, also known as their practical or exp uh, exper uh, experiment year, learning year? So, unfortunately not. That's something we'd love to do. The, the biggest problem, though, is actually accommodation in the area. Um, all mm. the landowners have turned their possible old farmsteads, um, houses no longer being used into accommodation for uh, mm. visitors to the area, tourists and so on, uh, or it's being used for their staff. So unfortunately, that is the biggest drawback, but we'd love to actually host students for their prep years. Lovely. So if anyone here knows of a farmer who has a farm <laughs> some accommodation, let the people know. Lovely. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Then from uh, Sibylla. Or a She's student a with a tent. Yes, exactly. I mean, that could also work. Um, I'm just going to ask one more question from the chat and then I'll move to the, to the audience again. Uh, Eugene and Ross, would you consider prese uh, presenting to and maybe joining an international network of privately protected areas, PPAs, uh, the long run, www.longrun.org, Grootbos is a prominent member. Yeah, so definitely. Yeah, absolutely. We actually work with the botanists from Grootbos on a regular basis to do um, veg monitoring in our wetlands uh, and in the Fanbos areas. So, yes, we'd definitely be interested. Wonderful. Cool. Brilliant. So um, I'll, we, we, we'll make contact with you and Sibylla, and uh, maybe she can discuss that a bit more. Then uh, there's a question from Liesl van Aas. I'm asking you to unmute. There we go. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, thank you for the presentation. I'm going to be the devil. 
with your SMA, are you sort of now um, putting it on the table that we have something similar like we have with marine protected areas with your SMAs? I am also a little bit familiar with the Dutendals fly area, the Web de Mont. So are you suggesting that we, with the terrestrial inland area, have the same concept that we currently have with marine protected areas? Because there's a huge difference between how we manage nature reserves and marine protected areas. Um, I'm not quite sure. I'm no expert in the marine arena. But what we're trying to do, just in a nutshell, is we, we try to, um, it's not pure conservation in the, in the textbook form. We're trying to combine conservation with agriculture and find a happy medium between the two. I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Just, I'm just going to unmute Professor Van Us again. In, in a way, yes, because that is actually what is happening with the marine protected areas where you have areas where you um, um, preserve a number of things, but you can still utilize that area. And that, that is the main difference between a marine protected area and the nature reserve. Nature reserve is hands off, don't do anything. Marine protected areas, depending on where they are. So that is my, my question of what do you aim to um, achieve with your SMA? Utilize the area or protect it hands off everything? Uh, no, it's actually more sort of, it's still utilized. So part of our uh, agreement with the landowners is we never take actual control of their properties away from them. It still remains theirs. They still have access to it. Uh, we just manage the natural areas on their behalf. So things like grazing can still happen. We still allow them to put their cattle or their sheep into the natural areas or the wetlands also provide summer grazing um, for the landowners. There's no sort of, um, in terms of completely hands-off approach, even in the Fanbos areas, there's still things happening like flower harvesting, um, restios get harvested for thatches, for thatching. Um, yeah, there's no sort of completely hands-off. We, as Ross said, working so, towards a, a medium where it is protected um, from Overutilization rather than all utilization. Sustainability is the key. Thank, thanks for that. And just a tip um, look into the biodiversity and wine initiative and, and use them and misuse them. And I did not say this. <laughs> yeah, some of our uh, landowners, the wine farmers, are involved with that already. So they actually looking to use us or being involved with everything as their um, biodiversity part of their wine. Lovely. Thank you very much. Chris, uh, do you have an answer or can I move to, uh, or question rather, or move to uh, Doc Taylor? Yeah, I just want to check. I'm not certain whether William Bond's question was answered. Not yet, um, not yet. I was just moving, I'm, I'm moving between the, the chat section and the and, and, okay. and audience questions. So I'll go let's to Dr. Then, then I'll go to, um, so just quickly, let's do Professor Bonds. Uh, what do the hippos graze on? How much grass is there in those wetlands? Okay, so there is actually a fair amount of grass there. Um, they also graze the really short little soft restios, but around the wetland edges are, um, the the hard agricultural areas which are fenced off and then they are the i don't quite know how to describe them they're the pasture areas so the pasture areas have the hippos and the game have access to these so there's a lot of grazing around the edges of the wetland and these pasture lands that we've now sent to the land and as well uh, if we can get uh those areas to for the game as well as your stock so there is enough grazing around there. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Eugene. Uh, Dr. Well, Taylor, I'm, I'm going to give you, ask, ask you to unmute. There we go. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, just a simple question, really. I, I might have 
missed it um, in your presentation, but just to get an idea in, in terms of size, perspective, uh, congratulations on that rehabilitation. I think it's great to see how, how wetlands and how river systems actually recuperate after a period of rehabilitation like that. But I'd like to know how many hectares have you been able to rehabilitate in that way so far? Well, uh, that particular project, uh, most of those studies came out of one particular project that is now, seven yeah, it's about seven kilometers of river system. Um, the initial project started as 200 or so hectares. Uh, through the help of the municipality, actually, we managed to expand it by about another 100 hectares. And the extension of that project will be adding a further 150 hectares of wetland. Uh, then, apart from the, the wetland, the Fainbos areas, uh, I would have to go and actually sit and calculate, but you're looking at another three or 4,000 hectares of Fainbos areas where the continual follow-up has actually benefited them as well. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. I mean, it's all very expensive and time-consuming. And also, when you look at the size of the system too, it's you know it's relevant uh, in, in in terms of perspective, relevant to to the size of the system too. And if one does rehabilitation and it's on a small scale, it turns out to be potentially ineffective. And as you were saying, one has to revisit the rehabilitation on a on a regular basis. So it's always good to know to what extent that rehabilitation has in fact been done over, over the, you know, the full area and so forth. So thanks very much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Then a quick question from the, or the, well, one of the last questions from the chat section from Sa Sandra Hardy. How do you control and monitor seepage of fertilizer and pesticides from agricultural areas into the wetland? Okay, well, we obviously discourage agriculture right next to the, the wetlands or the river systems themselves. Um, but also the monitoring by UWC, um, we, we watch that very closely. And to be quite honest, we're surprised that there's not more, but, but our water levels are healthy at the moment. So we do keep an eye on it. We also, um, in a lot of instances, we, in the process of recreating the buffer areas between the actual river or the wetland and the agricultural, the intensive agricultural areas uh, through pasture, um, just plain old grass pasture. So we've got that buffer zone as well, which helps leach out some of those chemicals. Cool, lovely. Andy, I'm going to unmute you. You can't just have your questions in the chat. You can ask, you can ask them in person. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, I just wondered if there's any management plan in place for your large herbivores that you've reintroduced. I'm assuming you've got no large predators to, to keep the numbers in balance. All right. So in terms of large predators, actually we've got Cape Leopard, if you want to call that a large predator. But no, we do have a management plan in place to manage our large herbivores like the buffalo, the hippo, uh, the eland, the bontobok, all of that, we have got a management plan in place where we monitor them on a yearly basis, do game counts, and then determine uh, how many animals we can actually support according to our carrying capacity and what we would then need to reduce our game numbers by. Lovely, thank you. Uh, yes, Chris. I had my hand up, but you're not you're not attending to my hand, so it's over now. <laughs> <laughs> but Chris, you you are you, you have all no, the that's time. What happens. You more than that's... I only have one question in the chat section, and no one else has the hands up. So the floor is yours, Chris, or the screen is yours. <laughs> that's what happens when you want to re rejuvenate. It's just totally take over. You know? <laughs> I'm I'm going to swing the question questions a little bit, Ron. Um, Eugene Ross, um, what were the most surprising sort of positive results that you got because of the involvement of land over owners? Well, obviously they have to be involved. And what are your bigger challenges when it comes to the landowners? I mean, this is private properties, people who had it through generations and now they sort of sacrificing it. I mean, they can plant there, they can cultivate, they can do whatever they want to do. 
So I'm sure in the process you were surprised by one or two things and on the other side you were possibly challenged by this. If I'm a farmer tonight or if I'm somebody who's excited to get something going like this, but I've got to deal with the landowners, just share with us briefly the, the yin and the yang of that situation, please. Start off. Um, so the whole initiative is actually driven by the landowners themselves. So although I say I work for the Nivias River Nature Reserve or the Nivias Wetlands Special Management Area, I answer to an executive committee, which then answers to the Landowners Association, all 25 landowners. So in actual fact, I have to report back to them on what is happening and are they actually happy with what I'm doing uh, on their property? Uh, trying to think how to explain it better. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, with anything like this, I think communication is key. And the better we communicate with the members, we're very fortunate to have a communication team, Love Green, that does that for us um, to a large extent. But the more they know and the more they kept up to date, um, the, the happier they, they tend to be. You know, like with any initiative, you've got a, a couple of key drivers that form the nucleus of, of everything. And we're very lucky to have a couple of landowners who are very invested in the idea. And a lot of them are just happy to, to go with the flow. Um, to be quite honest, I don't think we have any huge issues with the landowners. Um, but having said that, I came later, so a lot of the, the teething problems have been ironed out. But we're very blessed to have the landowners that we do have. They're all very supportive, without exception. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Lovely. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, Liesl van Aas, I'm going to ask you to unmute again. There we go. I just want to make a comment um, to Chris and to um, Eugene and Ross as, as, as well. I think this is the, the value of unlocking um, when it started um, during lockdown and the way that it has been progressed up until now is that we do challenge one another. We um, exploring and we also sharing, uh, not connecting to share screen, but we do, do um, reach a point where we actually tell people and the rest of the world what you're doing. And Chris, back to your, um, how can we send the message out there? And I think this is the success of Unlocking is that it's still a platform where we feel comfortable in telling the story and sharing. And this is now back to what Ross and Eugene is doing. It's amazing the work that they're doing. And we need to find a way to tell that um, to the powers to be as, as, as well. So. Thank you, gentlemen. So this is my only contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lidl. Very kind of you. I'm not a landowner, though, but I appreciate your comments. <laughs> um, just if I, I might just say, I think this is 10 years from now. This is the future. I mean, you travel Europe and you travel UK and many of these places. The integration is happening all the time, and it's speeding up. And as people in the world are becoming more and more uh, we will have no choice but to have this mosaic of agriculture and the integration of conservation, protection of nature within. And um, at, at this stage, it's still very in its infancy, infancy stage in South Africa, but this is where it's heading. I have no doubt about that. Uh, we're going to struggle to, in future, to have pristine areas still open and available. My thinking, my thought but that's what, where I stand. Uh, Ron, over to you. Um, Andy Klee's hand is not up. It's just a yellow flag behind him that you can see his screen. <laughs> <laughs> He's signaling us or something. <laughs> I don't know any signals, but it's fine. Then um, we have to backtrack a little bit now. Uh, there's a, a question from Graham, uh, Graham Baldwin in the chat. Uh, from a previous answer that you gave, Eugene, yeah, it was how on earth does one monitor how much agriculture, agricultural activity in the area is just enough, crops and animals? Are there software applications available that can suggest this based on the input of certain variables? Well, I'll, I'll try and address that. That's, that's quite a complex question. I think we're fortunate in that a lot of the areas that are worse suitable to agriculture 20, 50 years ago, already under agriculture. And a lot of the, the places, some of the, the ferro and the limestone areas simply aren't. So 
we're blessed in that respect in that you know the especially the the, the planted agriculture the chances are it's not going to expand a lot um the other monitoring that we do is basically just through communication you know if guys want to put new herds of animals on we can't really restrict them but we try and get involved in the process that's not an easy thing and it takes a lot of diplomacy at times um but no we don't have a, a, a software um, system that we can use to address this or monitor it I don't know if that answers the question. We will have to ask Graham that. Graham, if you if you can indicate if you have any more questions or feedback. Interesting. Oh, we, there we go. Interesting. I would have um, expected over over utilization uh, rather, but thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Oh, brilliant. Um, any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? You just raise your virtual hand, or then, as they say, poke me in the in the chat section with your questions, if I'm allowed. Uh, colloquial terms, nothing, no comments, no anything, nothing. Chris, something from you. Uh, Eugene Ross, any closing statements that you want to make? No, we're just <laughs> happy to have been able to help. Give this talk to you guys. And, and also, I think it's important that you all understand that we're learning as we go. So if anyone that was involved yet tonight has any suggestions or, or uh, contributions that they think could add value to our project, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Brilliant stuff. Then, Chris, I don't know about you. Our golden rule is usually when we reach one screen. We're not nearly at one screen yet. But um, if no, if there are no other questions or comments, uh, there's just no. lots of thank yous and brilliant, great works and uh, in the chat section that we'll send along. Um, any other closing remarks, Chris? Um, Ron, uh, thank you for taking over my job. I appreciate that. <laughs> we'll have to talk about the salary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Ron. Really enjoyed and. Uh, um, before I last word of thanks also to Eugene and, and Ross. Um, uh, these are, this is pioneer work. This is such pioneer work. And uh, I do understand but they, when they say they learn as they go. And again, this is just the encouragement that, you know, sometimes we have to just start and learn as we go. You know, you can overthink things sometimes. And then anyway, it doesn't happen that way. So well done to you guys. Uh, Sandra Harding for your surprise poem tonight. Thank you for that. We can get another poem. There was in the chat a request for her to do another poem. Uh, we will do that next week. Caroline Jost Robinson. That's also going to be amazing uh, discussion in terms of the involvement of everyone and the communities. Then, um, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to leave. We are a family. And if you want to unmute yourself, you can do so now. You're welcome to do so. And you can send your regards to your aunt and your uncle who might be living in another town. And uh, you can uh, uh, just ask any more questions that you would like to ask. Welcome. And I'm certain that Cheryl Ogilvie has something to say. Over to you, Cheryl Ogilvie. Chris, just before, uh, Cheryl, I'll give you a moment now. We just want to thank uh, Heather Dalton as well that has been assisting the two gentlemen uh, behind the screens. Uh, Heather, if you might pop up, <laughs> pop into the screen. There we go, Heather. Thank you very much for helping and um, moving along the slides so smoothly. Thank you. Cool. Uh, Doc? I actually uh, ran with another screen between the two of them. <laughs> um, it was quite a difficult. Yeah, it was a challenge, but well done. But we, um, I just want to mention that we will have to do it out, uh, over soonest so we can get it on YouTube. Um, uh, from the technical team side, there were some noise and things that we will not be able to edit out. So we will do it uh, as soon as we can, redo the talk and get a quality one on the YouTube. Thank you very much. Anybody who would like to join uh, Cheryl Elgavi, I think you wanted to say something. Um, yes, um, Eugene and Ross, may I ask permission, please? I have given my students a lovely assignment, 
and they've got to be they've got to attend um, ten LCAs, which are coming up, and yours was one of them. And yes, may I please send your email out to them so they can bug you? Um, it's not a huge group; <laughs> it's my smaller group. Um, there's only about ten students in the group, so um, if that's all right with you, they just may want to ask a few questions. Yes, not a problem. Um, they just got to go to our website. My email address is there. Or I can give it to you now if you really want. <laughs> um, um, Mariette gave it to me. And I, I'll, I'll, if, I, yeah, if I can just send it out to them. Because yep. I know they're going to start panicking soon. And I'm the dragon. So I'm the one that's got to mark it. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, thank you. And anyway, thank you for the, the good work you're doing. And just keep it up. And you're making a difference and hopefully my students can see it and follow in your footsteps one day. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Cheryl. Audrey Delsink, I'm not sure if I pronounced your surname correctly. You just popped out here. I didn't see your name before and suddenly your, your, uh, your screen is on. Uh, would you like to say hi or just accept on? No pressure, Audrey. <laughs> well, I, I feel a bit pressurized. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> um, no, I've been here all along. Um, and yeah, another brilliant presentation, although I, I, I am, I, I have to admit, there's a bit of a conflict of interest. I am married to to one of the, the speakers, Ross. So, um, but, but please note that I'm incredibly supportive of, of the project. And um, yeah, I think it is incredible. And um, yeah, thank you LCA for, um, for another brilliant presentation. And um, you know, nice to see some familiar faces um, amongst, the, amongst the panelists and the, uh, the, the virtual attendees. And well thank done, you, Eugene and Heather. Yeah. Thank you, Audrey. But you have to answer a question now, please. Uh, what what do they battle most? What's their biggest <laughs> battle? Sure. I don't know if I can reveal those types of secrets, Chris. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's I think it's the wild wind. To be quite honest, here yeah, that this part of the region has to offer. <laughs> I think that's one of the biggest challenges, um, especially for us that come from the low felt. We're not used to that. That's one of our most challenges. Um, yeah, but it's, it's uh, I think COVID has been one of the most significant challenges, but just um, resilience in persevering through these difficult um, climates, that's, that's, been, um, that's been the most significant challenge, I think. Mm, well done. And the challenge. Marty Jasper, I see that you want to raise your, you want to ask a question or come in. Yeah, I was just interested, um, guys, um, in terms of uh, fire in the whole system, is that uh, a problem or is that actually part of the system? I mean, we've heard quite a few different talks in terms of grasslands and savanna and even Feinbos and the importance of fire in terms of the whole system with these peat bogs, and I've heard that, you know, when a fire gets in there, it burns for days and weeks and almost impossible to put out. Is it a problem or is it actually part of the natural system? It is actually part of the natural system because if you go back to before we started creating lands and so on, when the fainbos burnt, that fire would have just run straight through the fainbos and into the wetland. Uh, but obviously back then the water table, because there were no aliens sucking up the water, would have been a lot higher. And we have actually ourselves done some burns in the wetland. Obviously we picked the time of year that we do it so that the water table has already started rising. So typically we would burn in about May, by which time the days are already shortening, it's getting colder, the water table has risen and you just get a, like a flash burn over the surface. But yes, at the wrong time of year, a burn in a wetland is a serious problem. Um, they actually had that in Armanus last year or the year before, where they had a fire, runaway fire that actually went down into the wetland and it burned for months. Yeah. No, cool, thanks. And, and then in terms of the actual plant species that make up this 
million year old peat? I mean, are the kind of extinct species right at the bottom or is it kind of fanboss on fanboss on fanboss or is there anything kind of interesting that they've discovered deep down? Because uh, I know they do cores and stuff in these peats overseas. Um, I was wondering if there's anything interesting fossils or anything else that you guys have found out about? Um, no, I haven't actually seen any data on our this stuff. Um, I don't know whether they took cores at all when we had the funding from the German government as I wasn't involved then. Um, but in terms of, no, I have not seen anything. Uh, the wetland veg, though, does tend to differ a bit from the fainbos surrounding in that, uh, although there is a little bit of overlap, the wetland itself is more restios, pragmites reed, typha, mit, uh, and sedges, and some of the grasses. So if you're actually standing there looking at fainbos and the wetland right next to each other, that's two completely different vegetation types. And when you talk about palm meat, is that a, a reed or what? I mean, I, I'm not from the yes. Cape, so I'm a bit uh, <laughs> okay, ignorant so, when it comes to palm meat. <laughs> the, the closest you're going to get to me describing it, it, it's actually a species on its own, but in terms of what it looks like, very much like a, a sedge, but the root system underneath is sort of like a big spongy type uh, thing. Uh, the speciality of Palmet is that when a river system floods, it actually just sort of lies flat and then just raises itself again when the waters recede. So it doesn't actually wash out like a lot of trees. Uh, typically, what's well, unique to the Fainbos bio, uh, especially uh, fast flowing permanent water. Cool, thanks. Thanks, guys. <laughs>